The talk, as you'll see, there's many titles I can give to this. This is just a real generic title. But what we're really talking about ultimately is how old is the earth, is what it's really going to come down to. Now, the Creation Research Society was founded in 1963, if you're not familiar with us as an organization. It's the oldest of all the major creation organizations. In many ways, though, it's the least well known because as a, society, as a research society, our focus is research. And we have, for the last 12 years, 13 years, done a science conference as part of being a science society. Anybody can be a member of the society if you agree with our position statement. And the whole purpose, of course, in the position statement is this is a society of Christians that are biblical creationists. If you're not a Christian or you're not a biblical creationist, you're not going to agree with our position statement, so you're not going to be a member of our society. But anybody that agrees with our position statement can be a member of the society, even if you don't have any scientific training or expertise. In fact, the evolutionists do keep track of our numbers. We know they do. And if our numbers suddenly started jumping up, it'd scare them to death. So join the research society and scare the evolutionists. <laughs> we publish the Creation Research Society quarterly, which is the oldest of the technical creation science publications. We also own and operate the Van Andel Research Center, which you just heard a little bit about. It was actually originally uh, paid for by funds received from J. Van Andel's foundation. We have just this past spring moved from our previous location to a brand new facility located on the campus of Arizona Christian University in Glendale, Arizona, which means we moved from the nice cool mountain regions of Arizona down to the hot valley area. Oh well, but we feel like it's a positive move in that it has us in a much higher profile location, it has us in a brand new facility, and we now can really interact a lot more with college students, and to me that's my passion because I see them as they're the last hope. My generation is lost. My generation is not, the baby boomers are not gonna be recovered. They're gone. Now we hope individually still get some, but the baby boomer generation is lost. I, my prayer is that we can reach this brand new generation and get their minds. Unfortunately, of course, right now we're not doing a very good job of it, but that's certainly my prayer, is get their minds, because that's what can turn societies around, is the next generation coming up. And I would see that some of the work we're doing at the society, some of the work we're doing at the Van Ando Creation Research Center, is information that will hopefully capture their attention, and now we can begin to tell them God's truth. So, dinosaurs, proteins and tissues. Charles Dickens wrote a book called A Tale of Two Cities. And in some ways, that's kind of what we have parallel going on right now, except we would consider it more a tale of two worldviews. You have the godly worldview and the pagan worldview. And I assure you, there's nothing in between. You're either godly or you're pagan. Whatever label you put on yourself, if it's not godly, it's pagan. So we have the two worldviews, godly or pagan, but it's not really a tell, it's a clash, because it's true, it's really going on. So we have the clash of two worldviews. So through this, I'm going to presenting what I would say is something very important for our worldview as part of talking about people in regards to this clash. In other words, capturing the hearts and mind of people. Scientists have determined that the Earth is about four and a half billion years old, ancient enough for all species to have formed through evolution. 
A lot of people say, well, I believe God created, but the age of the earth and how he created, that's not that important. Of course it is. That's just a simple dismissal because you don't really want to intellectually deal with it. First off, evolution is intended to deny God. Evidence number one, show me in any textbook, show me in any evolution journal where the word creator appears in a positive manner. It does not. The whole point of evolution is to replace God. God, we don't need you, sayonara, we're done. That's the whole purpose of it. So don't tell me that somehow evolution is the way God used it, which makes no sense, or did it, or that somehow evolution and God are compatible. They're not. If they were, we'd see God scattered throughout the literature. But it's not. He's not. Because the whole idea is we don't need God to explain what we think has happened. Second, time is so critical because time is what they need for evolution. Four and a half billion years. You give them a thousand years, they can't do it. And they know they can't do it. So time becomes the critical issue for them to be able to supposedly explain how evolution worked. Now, the irony is they won't even necessarily be able to tell you how it really works. They just think that if I get enough time, it must have worked. So time somehow becomes the magic wand. Well, if we just have enough time, somehow it worked. We don't know how it worked, but somehow it worked. So it always keeps coming back to time. So when people say, well, the age of the earth isn't important, of course it is, because it's a totally different history. The way they would interpret the fossil record is they would say, okay, this geologic region is older than this geologic region, which is older than this one, which is older than this one, which is older than this one. So they look at the fossil record and they see progression over time. So therefore, they would interpret it this way. This is what they see has happened. Obviously, this creature evolved into this creature, this creature evolved into this creature, and so on. That's why they're not near as concerned about what we call transitional forms as we think they should be. Because to them, it's not that big a deal. We just know that we have a change of life fauna moving from this age to this age, and this age to this age, and this age to this age, so clearly evolution is happening. And to them then, it's a given. And so their response then, when creationists say it's not a given, they're like, well, you obviously don't know anything. Because see, their interpretation, their mindset does not allow an alternate view. Right? I'm not trying to be unfair to them, I'm just trying to get you to understand that they simply cannot understand that this is not the correct view of Earth history. Creationists would say, let's take the same data, but the way we view it is that this was all laid down by the Great Flood over the course of the year or so of the Flood, plus then a little bit of activity in the years after the flood, including probably an ice age. So that means that this layer is maybe just a few minutes older than this layer, which is maybe just a month older than this layer, which is maybe just a week older than this layer. So all of the fossils in here represent animals that were contemporary of each other. So it's a snapshot of time, of a single point in time, not a record of change over hundreds of millions of years. Two totally different interpretations giving you totally different world views because they give you totally different Earth histories. One history is the history of a long cessation of biological change, a lot of new life coming on, a lot of old life dying off, and the other is a history of what we would call God's judgment at one moment in time in Earth history and all of this is a consequence of that judgment, and these animals did not evolve in each other, they are all contemporary of each other. So that brings us to what we're looking at is the Bible timeline versus evolution timeline. They're not one and the same, and people can argue and argue and argue about how they really are, but they're not. They're not one and the same, it's an either or, it's not both. And I don't, that's a whole nother talk to explain why they're not both, but it's an either or, it's not, it's not both. You can't have both of them. It's either the Bible timeline or the evolution timeline. And they give you completely different earth histories. 
And because they give you totally different earth histories, they give you completely different worldviews about the earth and about the history of the earth and therefore about the Bible's history and what the Bible says about man and the Bible says about the creation and the Bible says about God himself. <clears throat> so, the standard way of viewing the geologic column, what you're going to find in the textbooks, what you're going to find in the journals, is that dinosaurs lived in the time frames of the geologic formations called the Jurassic, the Jurassic, and the Crustaceous. And of course, most people have heard of Jurassic if for another reason, because they've heard of the movies Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Now the irony is, even from the evolution's perspective, the dinosaurs shown in those movies were actually crustaceous dinosaurs, not Jurassic dinosaurs, but anyway. <laughs> but what this does is it also constitutes what is referred to as the age of dinosaurs. Setting up the understanding that in Earth history, dinosaurs had their own age long before humans, long before dogs and cows and cats and everything that is alive today. Dinosaurs had their own age, so therefore dinosaurs predate everything that we would see today. And this is one of the reasons that evolutionists love using dinosaurs in teaching kids. You know, most kids, they know dinosaur names better than I do. They can take a book, and three years old, they can take a book, and I was reminded of that yesterday, eating with the pastor's family yesterday. He has a little grandson there. His little grandson was able to point out and name all the dinosaurs in the book. I didn't know half of them. But that's what happens, and that's common. Little kids, they're just fascinated with dinosaurs, and evolutionists love to use that as a hook. And even when your passion for dinosaurs begin to wane, you still have some of the basic understandings of, like, age of dinosaurs, meaning that dinosaurs have their own separate age from the rest of creation, or shall we say, the rest of what we see today. And certainly the idea that dinosaurs and man might have been contemporary, that's completely off the table. So then you say, well, where's the age of dinosaurs fit into the Bible? Of course, the answer is it doesn't, because there's no such thing. But to see how it starts setting up a whole different view of Earth history, which means you set up a whole different understanding of what God's creation is, who we are, who dinosaurs are, and ultimately your whole worldview is affected by what you view as your history. Now, if we're gonna talk about dinosaur tissue and protein, we need to first introduce exactly what is the anatomy of a bone. You have to understand a bone is not a rock. Bones are hard, there's no doubt. That's what allows us to stand. Our skeletal bones are what allow us to stand. Otherwise, we had just a jellyfish blob on the floor because jellyfish don't have bones. But the way a bone is made in general terms is you lay down a matrix of a protein called collagen. It's by far the most dominant protein in bones. And then what the body does is it uses special cells that coat the collagen matrix with calcium and phosphorus. People say you got to make sure you have your calcium. They forget to say you got to make sure you have your phosphorus also because you need both to lay down the matrix of the bone. So this is what certain bones look like, very air, very bubbly, very structured in this manner. You say they're not a rock, they are a tissue, even if they are coated with crystal. When you're young, your bones actually go through a process called remodulation, where you lay down a new layer of this about every 10 years or so. And as you get older, like everything else, it slows down. And that's where, as you get to a certain point in age, you have problems with starting to have brittle bones because you're not remoduling your bones very much anymore. But you have to understand this is the basic structure of bone to understand what it is we're then going to be seeing when we're talking about analyzing dinosaur bones. All right, so if an animal dies and its bone gets buried, what happens is the process is what's called mineral replacement. Groundwater brings in outside minerals like silica and calcium carbonate and iron and sulfur and deposits it in the bone and then washes out the original calcium phosphorus matrix that was in the bone. And this is called replacement. 
And the question is then, just how long does it take for this replacement to occur? Because apparently what we're being told now is it must take at least 65 million years. Yeah, who would have thought? I thought it was a lot faster than that, and so did everybody else, until they began to find this tissue. In the year 2005, a group of scientists led by a scientist named Mary Schweitzer published a paper in the journal Science. Now, the journal Science is the second most popular science journal in the world. And in this paper, they described the discovery of what they identified as red blood cells, intact tissue, and even fragments of the protein collagen. They followed up this paper very quickly with two other papers then in 2007. Now there had been prior to this some publications that hinted at the possibility of some biological material still in dinosaur fossils and other fossils, but it was usually dismissed as well, that's contamination or that's an error in your instrument reading or your instrument itself is not precise enough or there's contamination in the instrument or something like that. Schweitzer, to her credit, was very careful in how the analysis was done, so it was very difficult to claim it was some kind of contamination or some kind of error. And you also cannot discount the fact that typically science journals are black and white, but in this journal they used color and don't minimize the effect or trivialize the effect of color on the reader. They see that bright red and they can't discount it as just some type of bone piece. That obviously is something more than bone there. And so this paper, plus its two subsequent papers, drew a lot of attention of, wow, what's going on here? You're saying there's dinosaur bones, dinosaur fossils that have biological material still in them. And that doesn't make sense. And I think we would all understand why that doesn't make sense, because we recognize biological material doesn't last that long. I remember as a grade school student, you took the little experiment where you took the chicken bone, and you took the nail, you blared them both in the ground, came back a week, and they were both gone. And the only way you knew they were there is because you put a rock in there at the same time. I remember doing that. You can do that today. They'll both be gone. So we say, okay, so I don't think the material lasts that long that you would have 60 plus million years just by innate understanding of biology that the material would last that long. So clearly this was not real popular received. There was a lot of criticism because you see, they don't want any kind of misunderstanding or any, any of these crazy creationists coming in and saying, hey, look, that means the fossil's not that old. See, they get upset when we say that because you're not allowed to say that. Even though that's the logical conclusion, not allowed to say that. Since then, not to go through, we could spend a whole lecture just talking about everything that's been discovered, but since then, there has been additional studies that have found the pliable tissues, stretchable, pliable tissues, been found in a variety of fossils found in a variety of locations around the world by a variety of labs around the world. So it's not just one fossil from one location out of one lab. It's different fossils from different locations out of different labs. So if there's an air going on, they're all making the same air. Okay? There are morphologically distinct cells present in much of this tissue that is being extracted. Collagen fragments. Remember that collagen was the matrix you lay down the calcium and phosphorus on. Fragments of this protein collagen are still present and being detected, but more than even collagen, also other proteins, actin, myosin, tubulin, are also present in these samples that are being found or in these extracts from the dinosaur fossils. One study, for example, extracted blood vessels from a dinosaur fossil and they found that in this and this blood vessel it was an actual blood vessel it was still intact it was stretchable it had all the physical characteristics of a intact viable blood vessel and it still had in it pieces of protein collagen tropomyosin actin histones tubulin myosin 
All of these proteins, which you would expect to be in the blood vessel of a vertebrate animal, were there. And this is a dinosaur fossil. In fact, this dinosaur fossil is supposed to be over 80 million years old. So we would challenge that the presence of this biomaterial is a direct contradiction to, a direct challenge to the assigned ages of the dinosaur fossils. If the dinosaur fossils have been dated incorrectly, that means all fossils have been dated incorrectly. And if all fossils have been dated incorrectly, that means all rocks have been dated incorrectly. And suddenly the whole geologic time scale that they place so much importance in to have time for evolution collapses. That's why this is a all-in topic. Make no mistake, the evolutionist community is all in on this. They cannot lose this. They cannot because then everything falls. Everything falls. Now, one thing I always need to make sure I'm careful of saying, and sometimes I forget to say, regrettably, if we won and evolution fell, don't expect suddenly the church doors to be packed with millions of people coming in searching and finding their creator. That's not going to happen because we still live in a pagan world. What that means is that the community, the world will likely switch over to some kind of mysticism or spiritualism. They'll abandon evolution, but they're not suddenly going to become creationist because that takes a change of heart. They may change their science, but they haven't changed their heart. So we got to be able to meet them on two fronts. We got to meet them on the scientific front, but then we got to be prepared to rescue them when they lose their evolution. We've got to grab their mind and their heart to say, now go find your creator. Because otherwise they'll just look somewhere else, not looking for their creator. So it's not a matter of if we defeat evolution, creation wins. No, it's not the case. It just means they'll switch over to something else because they're still pagans. But it's an all-in situation in that by knocking down the cards of evolution, we now have opportunities that we would desperately need to take care of to be able to reach their mind and heart if we're prepared to do so. But don't just think automatically if we knock down the cards of evolution, we win. No, it's not. It's still a pagan world. All right, so this is where the Creation Research Society enters in. Because some of this work had been coming out and we were noticing then some of the pushback of it. We we're also noticing that this is really a subject that people kind of innately understand because they recognize you don't have biological material surviving for all that long a period of time. That just doesn't make sense. Plus, while we were not necessarily questioning the quality of work that the other laboratories were doing, we were concerned that they may not necessarily do all the work that they needed to do, and we didn't like the evolutionist community controlling the narrative. And as it turns out, we're right in doing so. So we thought, we've got to get involved in this. We've got to also then have a say in the research being done and be prepared to come in and do the work that they maybe will be not willing to do. And that's exactly what's happening right now. So in 2012, the Creation Research Society sent a team to the eastern part of Montana to dig for dinosaur fossils with the hope of finding us a fossil that would potentially yield us some kind of tissue or bio detectable biological material. And this is what we found. This Triceratops brow horn measures 46 and a half inches. But that's not the actual full length of the original because obviously the original went out quite a few more inches. And so we would say that the original length of this horn was at least 50, if not 52 to 54 inches. And so we'd recognize that this particular triceratops was huge. And in fact, this is, as our understanding, we were told by our museum guides, probably the largest triceratops horn pulled out of eastern Montana, if not the entire state of Montana. And of course, they were beside themselves because it would make such a beautiful museum display. We're taking it to break it up to extract biologic material out of it. So, you know, the price of science. 
Oh, one thing I did want to point out, though, notice, I mean, this is sandstone, so this is tough. We spent three hours pounding through this. But notice it's not very far down. It's only about a foot down. And it's also exposed just a little bit on the end. This fossil was not protected very much from the weather. In other words, when it was hot outside, this fossil was hot. When it was cold outside, this fossil was cold. When it rained, rainwater intercalated in to where this fossil was. See, so this is not what you'd consider pristine preservation conditions by any way, by any means. And when we pull it out of the ground in pieces, I'm sitting in the back of the truck looking at it, examining it, and I turned to my colleague and I said, I don't think we're going to find anything in this because it was wet, it was muddy. I already understood the condition of it. It wasn't really protected very well. And I thought, yeah, I will look because no one's ever looked at a horn before. But the odds of us finding something, even as a young earth creation, as a biblical creationist, I viewed that certainly even that few thousand year period of time is too long for anything to have survived. This is what was extracted out. One of the many pieces extracted out. This is biological tissue removed from that horn. It's stretchable, it's pliable, made the cover of the Journal of American Laboratory. These are dinosaur bone cells. And if you look at them under higher magnification, under electron microscopy, this is what they look like. This is classic of bone cells. That's why we know that it's not plant material, it's not bacteria contamination, it's not skin cells that we shed, because those all have a very different shape and morphology. Bone cells have a very distinct morphology. These are dinosaur cells that we found in that horn. All right, since then, a museum was digging up this vertebra from a Thessalosaurus dinosaur, and this end piece was so damaged that they didn't want it as part of their display. So they just wrapped it up and set it on a shelf, and it sat there for several years. Again, no special preservation condition. One of their interns one summer a few years ago wanted to come to my lab to learn about some of this extracting of dinosaur tissue. And she just brought this in piece with her just as something to tool around with. I had other fossils there, but she thought, I'll just bring this piece too. Why not? Just throw it in my suitcase. And so one day she was working at just digging away on this particular fossil. And then when you take that piece she just pulled off, she pulled off several pieces, take that piece she just pulled off, rinse it off a little bit, and this is what you have. Throw that on the grill and have dino steak. <laughs> and it was big, it was about that big. It's, not, it's just not some microscopic thing. You can tell by a relative scale to the tweezers how big it was. You see just how stretchy and flexible that is? This isn't petrified. Can anybody guess what it is that she's flexing right there? It's a blood vessel. Yes, we removed part of the fossil and there was this blood vessel just sticking right there. I think it's probably an artery just sticking right there. This, you are looking at a dinosaur blood vessel. Now, since the 2005 publication, there's been many advances in laboratory analytics. And one of those is called a Fourier transform infrared 
spectroscopy or spectrophotometer. And it allows us to use infrared beams of light to detect certain chemical bonds. And there are some unique chemical bonds of proteins such as collagen that can be detected by this system. So for example, a article published in Nature Communication 2017 identified collagen in a seropod rib that was dated at 195 million years. Now the key thing to understand about this is this analysis does not involve anything that would introduce contamination. Your system's not going to be contaminated by running other samples. You're not extracting it so you're inadvertently introducing anything from the air or from your skin or anything like that. This is analyzing an intact fossil. So as technology has advanced, it gets harder and harder for people to claim that this material is not indigenous, authentic, dinosaur, biological material. Right? And we see then a crustaceous bird, not a dinosaur, but from the same supposed age as dinosaurs. Same thing. FTIR analysis revealed presence of collagen still there. Another piece of equipment called second harmonic generation imaging. It's a similar type of approach where it again uses certain wavelengths of light to detect specific bonding patterns. In this case though, it's not a numerical you know, graph you're getting, it is an actual visual. And in this case, for example, see, these are pockets of collagen. I've got this from Brian Thomas who I guess will be here in November. And he's, we have a publication we're working on and it's sitting essentially on his desk. And if by November he hasn't gotten it back to me so we can get it published, then all of you have my permission to scold him, say, get it done. <laughs> when you overlay that with the actual fossil itself, then you see there's where the pockets of the collagen are on the fossil. Again, not introducing contamination because the fossil's left intact. See, that's, so these are just a couple of the many advances in instrumentation that are allowing us to detect even smaller quantities of biological material, but also detect in a way that is not going to be introducing any contamination as part of the process. So in 2015, a Nature Communication article said that the common preservation of soft tissue the common preservation. So notice in 10 years, from 2005 to 2015, it went from, wow, this is really unusual. How do we explain this to, oh, it's common, it's everywhere. And I would suggest it's always been everywhere. They just haven't been looking for it before. Now, here's where we're at as far as the chemistry of what's going on. All collagen studies show that collagen will totally degrade in less than four million years under any condition. And I say four million, that's being very generous. Most of the time, it's barely a million years under any condition. Four million, any condition. You cannot in any way somehow stretch four million to 60 million or 100 million or 195 million. Can't do it, four million. The biochemists know this. That's why most protein biochemists still don't buy that this is actual authentic tissue. Say, well, there's some kind of contamination even though they can't explain what it is. And that's the conundrum they're in. They can't explain how the contamination got in there, but they can't explain how the protein could have survived because they know it could not have. And I say, well, come on over to the light side. Other proteins have also been detected, as I mentioned, actin, myosin, tubulin. Now here's the push. Collagen is a much more hardy protein, much more resistant to degradation than most other proteins in the vertebrate body, whether it be a dinosaur or a human. We recognize that. Collagen is one of the toughest proteins. It degrades the slowest of most proteins. 
So if there's going to be any protein left, you would expect collagen. But when you're talking about actin and myosin and tropomyosin and tubulin, these are not near as hardy. But they're still there. They're still detected. And they don't last near as long. If they did, that steak you're eating tonight would be very, very tough. The animal science community has done lots and lots of work on the degradation of actin and myosin because that's critical to the softness of that steak you're eating. And they know these aren't going to last millions of years. They degrade much faster than that. Every time I've gotten into it, if you will, back and forth with an evolutionist, they want to talk about the toughness of collagen. I still point out it still doesn't work for them, four million years top. But I say, let's talk about actin and myosin and tubulin. And the response I get, chirp, 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 chirp. None of them, none of them have ever talked to me about it because they have no answer. They cannot explain how actin and myosin could survive 65, 70, 80 million years. They can't do it. And the reason is because it can't. The biochemistry is absolute. It cannot. I don't care if you encase it in lead. It cannot. These proteins do not survive. Their matrix is much simpler than collagen. They do not have the protection system collagen has. They simply cannot survive that long. That's the chemistry. So if you want to go with where the evidence of the science is telling you to go, then these fossils cannot be millions of years old. Case closed, we're done. That's it, all right? But obviously, that's not the way the world works. So they're going to try to push back with something. <clears throat> so, interesting point. Collagen is at its most stable form when it's most temperature sensitive. And remember, my, our, our triceratops horn would be fluctuating with the temperatures in eastern Montana. You know, how hot can it get in the summer in eastern Montana? Up into the 90s, even the 100s sometimes. How cold can it get in the winter? They'd say that Chicago, you don't have anything on us. We can get down 20, 30 below. So huge temperature shifts. Most stable when it's most temperature sensitive. Most dinosaur fossils that have the tissue found in them are not buried hundreds of feet deep by any means. You don't find fossils that deep. Most of the time, they're just a few feet deep at most. That's how you find them. If they're too deep, you never find them. This was pointed out in a 2008 science article that was pushing back against Schweitzer's original work in 2005 and 2007, saying there's a problem because based upon the evolutionist understanding of Earth history, the area where that fossil was found, the T-Rex fossil that Mary Schweitzer used initially, it's called a Hell, Hell Creek area there in Montana. The area where she found it, they would say was a megathermal environment at the time that fossil was laid down, based upon their timescale history. Megathermal environment. Excessively warm, excessively sensitive. Okay? And their conclusion was you can't have collagen surviving in that fossil for that long. And that's the chemistry of it. So, fossil biomaterial versus the standard assigned ages. That's now the conflict in this topic. All right, here's Mary Schweitzer. She stated in an interview a few years ago, this leaves us with two alternatives. Either the dinosaurs are as old as we think they are, or maybe we don't know exactly how these things get preserved. Fair enough. Here's the problem. As old as we think they are, See, that's not even allowed on the table. Can't discuss that. So it's all got to be some method of preservation. So it's not really an either or in their view. It's, I guess we just don't know how it gets preserved. Some magic wand or something. So obviously, how does biological material survive? The evolution community is not just sitting there, of course. They're coming up with ideas, desperately coming up with ideas. The question is, are there ideas have any validity or not? Okay. Well, this was presented 
recently in an article in the American Biology Teacher, which I was supplied as part of the communications getting ready to come up here. I hadn't seen this article before. What struck me about this article is, of course, this is what's being told to biology teachers that are teaching your kids. And it's worth reading simply to see the sophomoric academic level that the teachers are being taught. So we shouldn't be surprised that the teachers aren't able to teach the students at more than a sophomoric academic level, because this paper was atrocious. But I wanted to point this one thing out that struck me as just really bizarre. If some mechanism preservation can persist long enough to counteract degradation for thousands of years, why would it not be expected to continue to persist? Yeah, let's think about that a second. Okay, I have one of these at home. I assume you do too. Okay? If you take milk and set out in a nice warm room, you get about four hours and it's gone. All right? If I put it in a nice cold refrigerator, if I don't open it, it'll last for weeks. In fact, if it's pasteurized and sealed by st industry standards, it should last a minimum of four weeks if it's kept cold, a minimum of. That sell-by date is not really a sell-by date. Okay? It should last two weeks past that date. Most people say, well, it's one day before the sell-by date. You still got two weeks yet. Anyway, so based on that, that's a 20,000% increase. So according to the reasoning just presented in this American Biology Teacher article, then we would expect to be able to say that we should get if we can get 20,000% increase by a refrigerator, why can't we get more? Why can't we get years? Put their milk in there and come back in three years. See how it is. <laughs> well, I think we can understand the silliness of that reasoning because we're not saying that the degradation stopped. We're just saying that this method slows it down. But it still keeps degrading. No one can rationally argue that the fossils in the ground, the degradation of the biological material somehow stopped. They're just saying it's been significantly slowed down. So that reasoning to me shows that they're really not even thinking this through. I'm not saying it stopped. And what slows it down doesn't necessarily mean it slows it down for 80 million years worth of slowing down. There's a huge difference. All right, here is the popular model. That aside. A lot of evolutionists would poo-poo that also, say, yeah, you're right, that's foolishness, even though it's being taught to the science teachers. Okay, here's the most popular. We call it the iron model. The claim is that iron will stabilize tissue, that blood contains a lot of iron in the hemoglobin, and the bones have a high concentration of blood. I put a question mark there, because that's certainly a questionable statement. And then, therefore, the blood will serve as a source of preservation for the biologic material in the bone during that mineral replacement process. Okay, here's very simply how the chemistry works. Iron will catalyze reactions. And one of the products of these reactions is what is called a free radical. Now, you remember your chemistry enough that you know that a positive charged ion loves to react with what? Negative. negative charge and vice versa. Free radicals though, they don't care. They react with anything and everything. It's also why they're fairly dangerous. When you breathe in, in fact, when you breathe in oxygen, you form free radicals in your body and technically oxygen is carcinogenic. So you need to get the FDA to illegalize, you know, outlaw oxygen. <laughs> God, though, in his wisdom, put in your body these wonderful enzymes that get rid of those free radicals that you form as part of your breathing of oxygen. But obviously, the dinosaur is dead, so it doesn't have that going on anymore. So free radicals form when iron catalyzes specific reactions. The free radicals then start reacting with anything and everything. And one of the things they'll react with is they'll react with a peptide. Peptides are going to be portions of proteins, and the protein is going to be made up of each of these circles is an amino acid, because proteins are polymers of amino acids. And so the free radical reacts with different amino acids and causes those amino acids to bind to each other. 
So we actually have what's called a cross-linking. Simplest way to think of it is take a string and wad it up in your hand. The more wadded up it is, the more cross-linking has occurred. So the theory is, the thinking is, that the more cross-linking, the more wadded up, the more wadded up, the less accessible it is for microbes to get in and outside enzymes to get in and other degradative processes to get into that protein and degrade it. And there is some validity to this. This isn't just total bogus. There is some validity. But I think it works better for our side than their side. This helps explain preservation of a horn that you wouldn't think should have anything in it, but after a few thousand years still does. But does it explain a horn that they're claiming is 68 million years? And I would say absolutely not. Now, they've only done one study as a way of trying to confirm or empirically verify the actual iron model as a preservation system. One study. In this study, they took blood vessels from ostrich bone and they soaked them in water or they soaked them in hemoglobin. And with the water ones, they declared that in three days, you had significant degradation of the blood vessels. In two years, you still had blood vessels intact. So they calculated, oh, that's a 240 fold difference, therefore it's 240 fold increase. So if you're saying collagen would last at least a million years, and that means we could get collagen to last 240 million years. And that's the reasoning they used. Case closed, we're done, iron model works. We talk about it in the, in the movie Jurassic World, everybody knows iron preserves it. Next question, slide left, you know, go next. Well, we say, wait just a minute, let's stop here, stop the presses. These are their published pictures. I wish they would have been in color. They did the other stuff in color, they didn't do this in color. These are the published pictures. Okay, this is the hemoglobin soaked, this is the water soaked. Now, a few questions. When you go to the grocery store and buy a steak, you have one steak that's bright red and one steak that is nice and brown, which one do you buy? Yeah, the meat industry knows that. That's why that plastic wrap over that is very oxygen permeable because when oxygen hits hemoglobin, the hemoglobin changes, makes what color? Red. That's why when you bleed, it's red, because it's hitting oxygen. So the meat industry knows that. That's why as much as possible, they want their meat to be bright red. That brown one was probably sitting on the bottom and wouldn't get as much oxygen. Now, by that afternoon, when you leave the grocery store later on the afternoon, it might be red again. I guarantee you throw them on the grill, you won't know the difference but we like, we think that bright red, it just attracts us, it looks fresher. Okay, if I'm soaking blood vessels in hemoglobin versus water, what color are the blood vessels? Yeah, what color are the blood vessels soaked in water? Yeah, they're no color at all, they've been bleached out. They're gonna look anemic and pukey and weak and yeah. Subjective, subjective. Now why is that critical? Why is that critical? I'll explain in a second. Two years at a constant temperature sitting in a laboratory is not trivial, but can you really extrapolate that over to 70 plus million years at a fluctuating temperature? This would be considered pristine. This is hardly pristine, all right? But even more so, they admitted in the study that what they initially tried to do was soak the blood vessels in blood. And it didn't work because the blood, red blood cells, wouldn't lice fast enough. And the blood vessels began to degrade too fast and they couldn't get the blood vessels to lice and release the hemoglobin to get the iron out. So they mechanically disrupted the red blood cells. So unless the dinosaur is carrying its own blender around to blend up its red blood cells as part of its fossilization process, they have themselves admitted the process will not naturally work. It only works in the laboratory, All right? Next point, most dinosaur bones are found highly disarticulated. What's that mean? Do you know what that means? Yeah, it means they're found individually. Here's one bone. 
Here's another bone. Maybe there's another bone over there. That's why finding 70, 80% of a dinosaur is so rare and extremely expensive. If in your backyard you have 90% of a Tyrannosaurus rex, you're a millionaire. Because it's very rare. Usually it's one bone. It's all you find. All right, if most dinosaur bones are found that way, that means they're not being buried in a bloodbath. It's being broken apart, and this bone it sits isolated with all the blood available is just what's on that particular bone. You don't have enough blood to supply enough iron to be able to make this mechanism work. Water is a very harsh native control. As we just mentioned, it's going to make the blood vessels in the test look anemic because it's leaching out all the color. So they used what I would consider the condition that's going to give you maximum visual difference without there actually necessarily being an actual anatomical difference. But I think the biggest single problem with the study is that they provided no actual protocol of how they're measuring degradation. It was just simply visual. Now it's, oh, this looks more degraded than this looks which is why the red comes into play so much. Look how healthy this looks. Look how anemic that looks. This, to me, was inexcusable. And I mentioned before, I think Dr. Schweitzer has done excellent work. She's been very, very careful analytically through all of this except this study. Why all of a sudden in this study do they suddenly drop the ball? And they used very poor methodology, very poor analysis. They did not in any way attempt to actually do analytical measurements saying, okay, here is the thickness of the blood cell wall, of, the, of, the, of the, the blood vessel wall, and here's the blood vessel wall thickness a week later and two weeks later. They didn't do anything like that. It's just strictly visual. This looks more degraded than this. That's highly subjective. That's not acceptable. And this is their only study. They've not gone back and repeated it. They've not gone back and done it a different way. How many of you are familiar with the term, don't look gift horse in the mouth? I say that because we talk to younger people, they don't know that term. And obviously, if you don't know that term, what it is is one of the ways you would tell the age of a horse is counting its teeth. And the idea, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, is you get this horse that was given to you, you look in the mouth very close, and you realize this horse is 35 years old. It's not much of a gift horse. The term gift horse in the mouth means sometimes if you have something that's almost too good to be true or you, don't, you want it to be true, don't look at it too closely. Because you might find out, oh, and I challenge the evolution community, they're unwilling to look at the gift horse in the mouth. They have this iron model based on this one study, and they don't want to look any closer. And I think the reason is because they'll find out they have a 35-year-old horse. Now, another study, not we creationists that did this, another study that was published in other journals said, you know, because dinosaur fossils are mostly disarticulated, there's not enough blood available to the fossil in order for it to have enough iron. So we've got to get the iron from the outside, from the geologic source. Now the problem with geologic source is geologic sources of iron for the most part, especially in the fossil condition it's in, is very insoluble. But if you're using water as a transport medium, which is what they, that's all they got, it's not like they have milk or oil or something, it's all they got is water as a transport vehicle, You've got to solubilize it, which means the best way to solubilize it is a low pH. Low pH means acid. So we have to acidify the water to transport the iron. But of course, if we acidify the water, that means the, what happens when you put a chicken bone into acid? Yeah, the acid will start decaying, degrading the bone. So now we have a race. Will the acidic water bringing the iron in destroy the tissue before the iron water can preserve the tissue? So this is a conundrum that they face. They don't have enough iron in the bone. They gotta bring it from the outside, but the outside is a tough place to get the iron into the bone fast enough to preserve the tissue. So enter a second preservation model. I call it the burnt toast model. The burnt toast model is based on the idea that certain chemical reactions, which we call oxidations, result in particular end products of glucose and lipids. We call them AGE and ALE. These are end products of oxidation of lipids and glucose. 
The idea behind this model is that these end products will form a layer around the tissue and that's kind of like coating it in plastic. It now becomes a resistant layer. Okay, how are we doing on time? I'm sorry, we, technical issues, we slowed down a little bit. All right, intensive cross-linking also occurred just like with the iron model. Okay, and the reason it called the burnt toast is because this is the reaction that makes your toast brown. It causes a brown pigment to occur. So when you toast next time, just think of this model. That's why your toast is brown, because it's oxidizing and getting these end products. So here's the theory. You form a layer around the biological material, around the proteins with these end products, and that makes it impervious. Water can't get in, which of course then means you can't get the iron in from the outside world, so it seems like the two models are kind of competing with each other. Right? And also, the layer is to protect from bacteria. Bacteria can't get in as well either, and therefore that preserves from the bacteria coming in and degrading as well. That's the theory. All right. Many dinosaur tissue segments that have been extracted are not brown. Now, mine was. The one you saw that I showed, that was brown. But some of them are not brown. Some of them are white. And if they're white, then they don't have these end products, because these end products are going to cause a brown color. Second, Cross-linking, be it cross-linking because of this model or cross-linking because of the iron model, cross-linking reduces elasticity. How elastic was that tissue I showed you? It was very elastic. So how can you have massive amounts of cross-linking and still have that kind of elasticity? See, one of the things in the plastic industry is they introduced a lot of cross-linking and that gave a soft plastic, but it wasn't Flexible. It wasn't, you know, you couldn't pull it apart. It just had a certain softness to it. The more cross-linking, the harder it gets. You want harder plastic, you'd make more cross-linking. Also, it would change the chemistry of the amino acids. If you're detecting certain amino acids, which is what you need to do to detect the collagen and the actin and the myosin, they have to go unmodified. But yet, these models, both the iron model and this burnt toast model, will cause reactions that will actually modify the amino acids. This is a big one to me. There's not a shred of experimental evidence to support this model. It's just on paper, they made it up, looks good, close enough, we're fine. So they're not even willing to accept the gift horse, let alone look it in the mouth, okay? They absolutely don't want to do any experimentation on it at all. And we would challenge then if you're saying this preserves things, there's even biological material found on fossils that are claimed to be 450, 500 million years old. So you're saying that this preservation model preserves longer than synthetic plastics would last? But yet this is all too often the response to the evolution community. Well, no problem, we got it explained. Iron, oxidative end products, it's explained. But you have no experimental verification. Oh, it doesn't make any difference. We know it must have preserved. They just hand wave it away. No problem. I think, though, this is perhaps the biggest problem of all that they face. And that is that all fossils absorb ground radiation. As Jeffrey Botta stated, environmental radiation would have degraded its body Bones absorb uranium and therium like crazy. You can take a Geiger counter and run it over any fossil and it'll light it up. They all absorb radiation. And if you're talking about a fossil that's supposedly been in the ground for 70, 80, 100 million years, it's absorbed so much radiation over the time of that that, as he says, you get an internal dose that will wipe out biological mo biomolecules. And neither the iron model, nor the burnt toast model, nor concrete, nor lead is going to prevent that from happening. So there's not a single model that addresses this. Again, when I challenge evolutionists on this, how do you explain preservation with prolonged exposure to ground radiation? Chirp, 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 because they can't. They just simply won't talk about it. So we end with the idea that dinosaur biomaterial is 
not consistent with the assigned ages of the fossils. Remember, if the assigned ages of dinosaur fossils are wrong, that means all fossils are dated wrong. If all fossils are dated wrong, that means all the rocks are dated wrong. If the rocks are dated wrong, then the evolution does not have time, and the house of cards falls. But we would say it's totally consistent with an age of an Earth less than 10,000 years. Especially if we're talking about that these were formed during the flood of Noah, which was some 4,000 or so years ago. Totally consistent with that time frame. And I'll end with Bible timeline versus evolution timeline. What Christians have to understand, it's an issue of worldview. In the beginning God created, in the beginning was the Word. All scriptures God breathed. What is the authenticity of scripture? And are we going to have death before or after sin? Because you see, with the time frame evolution is running, that's death before sin. And use this verse, Romans 8.10, use that verse. You die physically because of sin, but you live spiritually because of Christ. Explain that. See, they want to say, well, God was telling Adam and Eve, you'll die spiritually because physical death already existed. Well, then how did Paul say you die physically because of sin? Apparently, Paul didn't understand then that death already, physical death already occurred. But that also makes God the author of physical death. Very important theological question. Very important theological question. Human domain. If the earth is four and a half billion years old and humans have only been around the last one-tenth of one percent, humans have domain over nothing. Oh, by the way, most animals have come and gone. Most of the earth history has come and gone before you even came onto the scene, but you got domain. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Domain over nothing. Global flood. The Bible very clearly teaches it was a global flood. Denial of that is simply denial of God's word. Very clearly teaches it's a global flood. Any global flood, even if Earth history was represented in four and a half billion years of evolutionary change, the global flood would have said, yeah, but I'm going to redeposit all that. I'm going to wipe that out and redeposit. So even if you think that was Earth history, the geologic record is still going to be a record of the global flood, not of evolutionary history. That's why evolutionists have to deny the global flood. But see, the global flood's response to what? It was response to God's judgment of sin on earth. So when you say there was no global flood, what you're really saying is God doesn't have the authority or the right to judge. Scoffers will come, as Peter says in his second letter. And what are they going to be scoffing at? Peter's very clear, they're scoffing at creation and the flood. Scoffers will come. That's why it's so critical. Christians have to understand there's a connection of all of this dealing with your understanding of Scripture, your understanding of history, and your understanding of who you are in God's creation. So, Bible timeline versus evolution timeline. The two do not interlap. They are totally dichotomies of each other. Some resources I have back there on the table. I have this book. This was sold out. This is sold out. Sorry, there's only so much I can pack in my suitcase. But I still have this book. It's a book I wrote about this topic. As well as I have a few videos of, if you're familiar with Is Genesis History, if you don't have that video, I also have some follow-up video that the producers did with material they had from Is Genesis History. So I have some resources on the book table if you want to follow this up more. And I'm sorry we went a little bit over time, but... Technical glitches just always have so much fun. And anyway, questions.